Oral questions by members? Member for Peace River South. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, we know that the NDP are the uh, most secretive government here in Canada, but they cannot hide from the facts. New figures show in British Columbia here, in the month of January, the cost of living went up 4.3%, driven mostly uh, because of the rental increases of almost 4% that we've seen here. Look, gas prices are up, grocery prices are up, housing and rent prices are up. Almost every single thing is more expensive in the province of British Columbia under this NDP government. The Premier promised British Columbians that he would fix the rising cell phone bills. Never happened. He promised he would fix gas prices that are going up. Never delivered on that promise. And he promised a renter's rebate. None of the Premier's promises are coming to fruition. He's not delivering on any of them. So, can the Premier tell the Legislature today, after five years of saying, well, we're working on it, it's been five years, when will he deliver on any of his promises? Let's start with the $400 renter's rebate. Minister of Finance. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, rising prices are no doubt a concern uh, for British Columbians. And it's, and it's a concern for Canadians right across this, right across this nation. We're seeing a, it's a national issue, 5.1% increase nationally, 4.3% here in BC, which is uh, the lowest among the major provinces. Um, we are uh, continuing to engage with the federal finance minister, encouraging uh, her to use the tools at, at, at her disposal. But I have to say, Mr. Speaker, uh, I think we need to remember uh, where we were at when we formed government. Childcare. We have childcare. Members. That is growing. Least of them, Mr. And re reducing fees on childcare has real meaning for Order, please. People. Order. Members. MS Members will come to order. They don't delivering child care, so let's talk about something else, Mr. Speaker. MSP premiums are gone. <laughs> Eliminated. And I'll, I'll leave with one more before I take my seat, because I believe there's probably more. Let's talk about the tolls. How the, the tolls have been eliminated, and what that means, it means money in the pockets of British Columbians who've had to pay because that, the people on the other side insisted that they pay a toll to get across the bridge. Member for Peace River South Supplemental. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Actually, where we're at is a long and ever-growing list of broken promises from this government. Look, house prices are at all-time high. The average family now in British Columbia is paying over $3,600 a year more if they are eligible, if they can even live in British Columbia anymore under this government. Affordable government has, uh, sorry, affordable housing has gotten so bad under the NDP that they've even secretly called in outside auditors, Ernst and Young, to send their housing plan back to the drawing board to be looked at. Hmm. The NDP's failures have real impacts on people. We know this. We look at Gianna from Maple Ridge, and I quote, our rent, our rent is half of our income. We don't even have the room to save between paying off whatever debts that we have. You have to have a cell phone bill. We know those aren't cheap. The rent itself is extremely expensive. All our expenses just leave nothing for savings." End quote. So instead of grandiose statements and broken promises, maybe the Premier can try something different and deliver on a promise to help bring relief for the renters of British Columbia. Will they do that today? Minister of Finance. 
Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I, I thank the member for the question. Uh, we've continued to address uh, housing in this province since we formed government in 2017. And I know the members really don't like that we've been active on this file, Mr. Speaker. I know that they don't like that we have been making progress, whether it was fixing the, uh, the fixed-term lease loophole that they said was too complicated. It was the very first thing that we did as a government. The fact, the fact that we eliminated the additional 2 percent automatically on every, every uh, uh, year, uh, we eliminated that. That saved thousands thousands of dollars for British Columbians, Mr. Speaker. We're continuing to work on, the, on, on um, the, all the elements of the 30-point plan. Um, every, every single um, uh, of those 30 points has been um, uh, worked on or completed. I'm sure that the Housing Minister has all the, the specific details on, how, on, 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 on all the ones that are complete. I think it's, I want to say it's 11 are complete, or it could be 16, so if, if the members want clarity, I can, uh, we can certainly get that for him. The other thing I want to leave um, the members with is that one of the things that we've certainly uh, been seeing uh, since we formed government is that the average hourly wages in BC have inc increased more than any other province in Canada. And, and, that's, and, that's, and that's good news for British Columbians, Mr. Speaker. Leader of the Official Opposition. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I might point out to the Minister there's a huge difference between making promises and making progress. And I can tell you which side this minister is on. And one of the key elements that this housing minister has forgotten to pay attention to in five years is the supply side, completely missing in action. So while the finance minister stands up and makes everything uh, sound like uh, she understands it, let's look at what the average family is facing in British Columbia. $3,600 more a year in rent under the NDP. But it's not just young families or first-time homeowners, it's actually seniors as well. Yesterday, a critical report from the seniors advocate in British Columbia demonstrated that there is a growing gap between sky-high rents and, and the NDP and a shrinking rent supplement. For the first time ever, yet another record for this government, for the first time ever, $2 million less was provided in rent subsidies to seniors than the previous year. Wow. And the number, this one is even more shocking, and maybe the finance minister is aware of this, the number of subsidized housing units also decreased. And guess what? It's been shrinking over the last five years. Wow. Today in our province, well, you know, it's funny. Perhaps they'd like to say, here's the number. Here's the number. Today in British Columbia, there are 9,000 seniors on a wait list. And guess what? That wait list has grown by 45% when? in the last five years under this Premier's watch. So let, let's ask the Finance Minister then, does she think it is acceptable that there are 9,000 seniors in British Columbia up by 45% under their watch? Is that acceptable in our province? Attorney General. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Um, the, uh, in 2018, we increased the rent ceiling for SAFER. Uh, it increased the average monthly payment to seniors by about $78. Or, uh, uh, and, and so I don't, I don't know what uh, data the member is talking about. There's 3 percent more. 3 percent more. There's 3 percent more. Members. There's members. There's there's 3% more safer recipients now in British Columbia uh, comparing uh, end of year 2019 to end of year 2020. Uh, we've increased support for seniors. We're building housing for seniors, which was something that they didn't do, Honourable Speaker. They just did not do it. Now, we have, we have 10,000 10, homes under construction right now. When they, were, when they left government, they had 2,000 affordable homes under construction. That's five times. And, and members, members, be quiet, please. I, the, the members on the other side are so out of touch about housing. Let me, let me just give you one idea about how out of touch on housing they are. This is the, this is the Monday morning motions, okay, from February 13th. 
The motion was, be it resolved that this House support this government's actions to create affordable housing for all. The member for Kootenay East says, I'd just like to say it's appalling that this government would put this motion forward and I don't support it. That's how, you don't support action on affordable housing? That's no surprise to me. Your actions spoke louder than words when you were on this side of the House. Leader of the official opposition, supplemental. Well, thanks very much, but with all due respect to the Housing Minister, let's talk about who's completely out of touch. The words came from an independent officer of this legislature, the Seniors Advocate of British Columbia. Here's the report. I'd suggest you look at page 41. And he may want to stand up and be flippant about this, but let's look at what the facts in the report laid out. The facts speak for themselves. The wait list is up 45% in the last four years, in the words of the Seniors Advocate of British Columbia. Our government, for the record, created almost 13,000 new units of, se of seniors housing when we were in government. But guess what? Guess what the report points out? That under the NDP, Members. those units, the number of units, have decreased. The report yesterday that was released made it clear there are less units today than there were five years ago. The rate of senior subsidized housing relative to the population, guess what? Newsflash to the minister, decreased by 14%. And guess what else happened for seniors in British Columbia? The median wait time has increased to two years, which is a 19% increase over last year. Not our watch, this minister's watch. The facts are clear. This, this two-term NDP government has been an abysmal failure when it comes to affordability in British Columbia. Whether it's housing or rent or groceries or now subsidized housing for seniors by every single measure, this minister's legacy is one of failure. Can he get up today? and tell the 9,000 seniors and their families whether it is acceptable to be on a two-year wait list for subsidized housing under his government's mandate. Minister of Housing. Uh, Honourable Speaker, we know that there's been huge pressure on housing. Uh, we have a significant number of people choosing to move to British Columbia, putting pressure on our housing stock. We've put a huge amount of emphasis on increasing the supply available of housing available to people. Uh, increasing the member's question was about safer. She suggested that we reduced access when in fact we increased access to safer. That was what my point was about. I don't disagree with the seniors advocate that it is hard for seniors out there. It's hard for renters out there. And we are working as hard as we can to bring housing on. And the member to stand up and say in 16 years they built 13,000 units, and that's a point of pride for them, Honourable Speaker. That is a point of pride in 16 years, le less than a thousand units a year, and they stand up and say, "What an accomplishment of our government! We were prepared." Members for the will come to order. I think the members find it funny that some families live in condos. I don't find that funny. Families have to live in condos, honourable speaker. These members, these members are members. We Members, that's enough. 50,000 affordable units, Honourable Speaker, in the five years since we formed government. That's a number to be proud of. Leader of the Third Party. Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Indigenous people in BC comprise less than 5% of the province's population. Despite this, Indigenous children have been and continue to be disproportionately represented in care. Indeed, in 2020, Indigenous children were 19 times more likely than non-Indigenous children to be in the child welfare system. Last September, Justice Skullroot ordered certification of a class action lawsuit in the case of KS versus British Columbia, the Ministry of Children and Family Development. The class action was, to, was set to provide justice to children in care who were victims of the government's decades-long negligence. 
Given the disproportionate representation of Indigenous children in government care, this class action represented an important step towards reconciliation. Despite this, the Office of the Attorney General is now appealing the decision to certify this class action. Mr. Speaker, this government has expressed a desire to pursue meaningful reconciliation. However, it is actively fighting against justice for Indigenous children in care. My question is to the Attorney General and Minister responsible for housing. How can the government be committed to reconciliation while actively fighting against justice for children that have survived the child welfare system? Minister of Children and Family Development. Well, thank you, Honourable Speaker. Thank you to the member for the question. As she mentioned, and as she knows, uh, the matter is before the court, so it is not possible for me to speak to the particular matter that she mentions. I would like to acknowledge, however, that Indigenous children and youth have been overrepresented in the child welfare system for far too long. Our government is absolutely committed to a transformation of the system to make sure that Indigenous communities are able to exercise jurisdiction and take care of their children and youth and families in the way that they want to. We know that it's critical for the health and well-being of children and youth to be connected to family, community and culture. Honourable Speaker, we've already made changes to provincial law. We've been investing in Indigenous communities for children to stay with aunties or grandmas or people in the community so they continue to have that connection. And we are absolutely committed to working in partnership with Indigenous communities, rights holders and leadership to transform the system and to make sure that Indigenous children and youth stay connected to their families. Leader of third party, supplemental. Absolutely. Thank you, Honourable Speaker, and I wasn't asking for a comment on the case. I was asking for this government to reconcile how it justifies spending money to fight against survivors of the child welfare system instead of spending that money to support them. For 50 years, the BC government has failed to apply for benefits and compensation for tens of thousands of children in care who have been the victims of crime. For decades, children have been taken from their families only to be neglected by the government that was supposed to be taking care of them. On CTV News, the representative plaintiff stated, quote, I made suicide attempts as a child and I still struggle with suicidal ideation to this day. I wonder what my life could have been like if I had had timely access to those benefits. In the throne speech, given just last week, this government said that they were committed to, quote, healing the wounds of the past. But this issue is not only from the past. This government is choosing to spend public funds and resources to fight the victims of the child welfare system instead, as has happened in other provinces, of working collaboratively with them and compensating them for the decades of neglect that they experienced as wards of the province. My question, Honourable Speaker, is to the Attorney General. How does the Attorney General justify spending money to fight survivors of the child welfare system instead of spending money to support them? Mr. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Honourable Speaker, uh, this is a serious issue, the over-intrusion of uh, government into the lives of children and families in Indigenous communities. It has gone on for far too long, and our government is committed to reconciliation and to making sure that children, youth and families are properly supported and that communities exercise jurisdiction so that children and youth remain connected to their family, community and culture. Because we know, Honourable Speaker, that that is the most successful outcome for those children and youth and their communities. We have been doing work to change this. We currently have the lowest number of Indigenous children and youth in care in 20 years, and there is a lot more work to do, Honourable Speaker. We are supporting and investing additional funding, for example, into cultural connections programmes, and Budget 2021 provided more than $13 million of new money to support 
alternatives to care so that Indigenous children and youth can stay Members. with family. Honourable Speaker, Mr. our government is making choices of investing in children and youth and families. There's a lot more to be done, Honourable Speaker, and we are committed to achieving that transformational change. Thank you. Member for Kamloops, North Thompson. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and we were hearing time and again about the affordability crisis and the lack of action from this government, be it on rental housing, be it on seniors' rental housing, be it on gas prices. We've heard time and again from this Premier that he had a plan to bring down the, the price of gas. Nope. Hasn't happened. We're nope. seeing record high gas prices now. We have the highest gas taxes in North America. The NDP has used every tool in the toolbox to try to constrain our supply through the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Yep. And now, as of January 1st, there's new rules from the provincial government that is further uh -oh. shutting off access to fuel from Alberta. And we've heard the minister talk about trying to deflect again by having the BCUC do yet another review of gas pricing in British Columbia, which we all know last time was a bit of a sham because government policy and taxation was excluded and they were not allowed to look at that. So to the Premier, if we are going to see the BCUC be asked to do another review of gas prices, will they actually stop interfering, let the BCUC actually do their job and look at the impact of government policy, government taxation on the gas prices in British Columbia so we can explain why we have the highest gas prices ever seen in British Columbia under this Premier's watch? Minister of Energy and Mines. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. As the Minister of Energy, my responsibility is to make sure that BC consumers are treated fairly by gas wholesalers and retail chains. That's why we initiated the uh, uh, Fuel Price Transparency Act. And that's why the BCUC, the energy watchdog, is investigating retail prices and the setting of those retail prices here in British Columbia. What's clear in the opposition's approach uh, is that all they wish to do is give a huge gift to the major oil and gas companies. What, what Werner Antweiler said, the professor at the Sauter School of Business, is the focus on Members. taxes that we see from the BC Liberals would not change the retail price whatsoever. It wouldn't change prices. It would boost the profits of the oil and gas companies. That's their solution. They're in bed with the oil and gas companies <laughs> and not with the services. Kamloops, Kamloops North Thompson Supplemental. Members, order please, order. Members will come to order now. All members. You're wasting very precious time, members. Member for Kamloops, North Thompson. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. This side of the House is actually on the side of average British Columbians that are now paying. <laughs> that are now spending it. Members. Members will come to order now. Members will continue. Nick Gallery is certainly lively today. <laughs> Average British Columbians that are spending $45 a fill more for their minivan under this Premier's watch. Here, here. Average British Columbians whose affordability is completely going off the charts. And it's interesting that this 
minister wants to talk about transparency from the most secret of government in Canada. <laughs> They've ignored the mounting unaffordability. They ignore that supply has any issue at all when it comes to pricing of anything, housing, gas, you name it. We have the highest gas taxes in North America, and we have government policy that is further restricting supply, putting pressure on the prices. In fact, I have a customer pricing notification from a fuel supplier in Alberta, and it says, due to government restrictions in, you may want to listen, because I have news for the members uh, opposite. Our gas comes from Alberta. <laughs> Due to government restrictions in BC, we are unable at this time to sell fuel from Alberta into BC past December 31st, 2021. That's government of British Columbia policy that is restricting the gas supply into the BC market. And if they do ship it in by truck, Mr. Speaker, they have to pay an extra 25 cent fee to the provincial government to be allowed to fill up at their gas station. So when will this minister allow the BCUC to actually look at government policy, government taxation, and explain why we have the highest gas prices in North America under his government's watch? Minister of Energy and Mines. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's clear that this member chooses to focus on, on taxes. And what I've just said... What, but, but on April 1st, on April 1st, the carbon tax will raise the price of gasoline one cent. Uh, it, that does not explain the increases that British Columbians have seen at the pumps, and it's discouraging and disappointing from the party that brought in the carbon tax members. To, uh, to hear the member argue against the measure. Hear the member argue against a measure that is proven to reduce emissions, encourages sustainable economic development, and funds continue investment in low-carbon alternatives. That's, that's the position of the BC Liberals on the carbon tax. Member for Campbell, South Thompson. Oh, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, last year, uh, the most secretive government in, in Canada uh, exempted half a billion dollars of taxpayers' money from the, uh, the scrutiny of, of FOI. Mm -hmm. uh, the Minister of Jobs claimed at the time that his high-risk venture capital scheme uh, would be making investments by last fall. Uh, he also uh, had uh, said that he, he hoped that there would be a business plan uh, put out, and I quote, in the very near future, end quote. Well, after uh, almost a year since the scheme was announced, uh, there's uh, no chief investment officer. They haven't published uh, any investment criteria. They haven't pushed a single dollar out, uh, okay. out the door uh, for economic recovery, and there, there still isn't a business plan. No. Mr. Speaker, if only results mattered to this government. But like, but like housing, uh, gas prices, and affordability, uh, this government simply can't deliver. But let's come back to the secrecy element of this, uh, this high-risk uh, in, in investment yes, scheme. The there's, a, there's, a pretty, there's a pretty good reason why the government doesn't want the public to have access to any of the, the information about this, about this scheme. We've obtained documents that hint at what some of those activities might be within the scheme. Uh -oh. And I'll read a quote. I quote, the BC government has access to incredible data sets, including via the BC Cancer Society. Allowing that data to be accessed and monetized could be a huge draw, end quote. Uh -oh. Let me repeat that. They're thinking about, this government is thinking about selling cancer patient data for investment purposes. No wonder this government is so darn secretive about NBC. So the question uh, to the Premier is this. The question is this. Is the reason that this government is not subjecting this high-risk venture capital scheme to FOI because they're looking to sell British, Columbia's per British Columbians' personal health data like that of the, from the BC Cancer Society? And what specific personal health information does this pla uh, government plan to sell? Minister of Health. <laughs> Minister of Health. Uh, Honourable Speaker, the answer to the question is no. Oh. 
Member for Abbotsford West. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Speaker. It is uh, admittedly quite an achievement in uh, just four and a half years to secure the title of most secretive government in all of Canada. Uh, Your award. Can we see the trophy? Look, <laughs> it's a red carpet if you want to walk back and forth on it again. Celebrate Members, it. let's have the question, please. Credit where credit's due. They've worked hard to secure the title. <laughs> just, uh, just this week, we uh, saw the, the minister who's actually responsible for promoting access uh, to information refused to release the one document yep. that can confirm whether or not she was telling the truth in explaining how the government imposed fees and actually limited people's access to information. We, uh, we just heard about a half billion dollars in uh, public money that uh, uh, the government uh, refuses to make uh, applicable, make uh, freedom of information uh, rules uh, applicable. But now, interesting, uh, I guess, uh, to end the week, uh, another decision, another decision from the Office of the uh, Information and Privacy uh, Commissioner, this one uh, involving uh, the Premier's office directly, uh, another attempt by the, uh, the Premier, the Premier's office, and the government to uh, withhold information. And in rejecting the Premier's arguments in favour of withholding the information, here's what the adjudicator had to say about those arguments, uh, Mr. Speaker. She characterized uh, the Premier's arguments as, in her view, vague, cryptic, uh -oh. speculative, and hypothetical, and refused the government's attempt to withhold the information that was subject to this application. So my, my question is actually to the minister responsible uh, for protecting access to information. What steps has she taken, what specific steps has she taken to address this culture of secretiveness from the most secret government in Canada that re revealed itself yet again in this ruling from the adjudicator who described the approach of the government as vague, cryptic, speculative, and hypothetical. Minister of Citizen Services. Thank you so much, Honourable Speaker, and I, I'm really happy uh, to answer this question because I absolutely con continue to be astounded uh, by the members opposite and, and their, their um, assertions around openness and transparency. I mean, we, we all do not forget how the Opposition House Leader, who just asked members. a question about this before, was responsible, his office was responsible for triple delete. His own... His own staff had to whistleblow uh, after colleagues deleted emails regarding the Highway of Tears after an FOI request came in. But, uh, like, Speaker, we Members, should just hear from the member himself. Why don't we do that? Let's hear the answer, please. Yeah. Oh, 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 I am answering. Members will Thank come you. to order. Okay, we're going to hear from the member himself. I have triple deleted my emails from time to time, end quote. Now, I know we were also all shocked to learn when the member also removed pages from an ICB ICBC document before uh, releasing it to public, resulting in the infamous uh, dumpster fire we have. And the member who just asked the question uh, is famous for not using government email or emails to conduct government business. Okay, you know, this is the record of the BC Liberals. So they want to know my record and they want to know what I've done to improve openness and transparency. Happy to tell the members. members because I think it's important to Members will this come record. to order. That's enough, please. Can't help but heckle. 
just said I was Continue. answering the question. Uh, so under, I'm very happy because I think we need to correct this record. So under the BC Liberals, there was no obligation to document decisions made by government. We fixed that. We've increased proactive disclosures by 75% here in BC. Six additional categories since I came in. To, these are ministers' estimates binders. These are budget binders. Arguably, the member that's not going to help. She's going to make her answer. So let's listen to it. Okay. These are arguably the most valuable information available online to all for free. We've increased the amount of data sets available to people and organizations to 3,200. I've implemented mandatory breach reporting, increased the number of public bodies that fall under FOIPA. Uh, oh, I added a new offense for willfully deleting documents like they did. Official, uh, had the opposition house leader triple deleted right now under our watch, it would have cost the member fifty thousand dollar fine. Thank you. So, oh, and we're consulting in this province more than any other government before us. Yeah, we're do we are currently at about two hundred and fifty consultations because it's important to hear from people. That's Members double what those members order. did. That's our record. That's my record on openness Thank and transparency. Thank you for the time, Speaker.